This podcast contains explicit content and is intended for mature audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Don't say we didn't warn you. Hi, my name is Madison, and you are listening to Who's Knocking? A true kind podcast. True crime podcast. It's a true crime podcast. <laughs> How's your Halloween? Happy Halloween, Halloweeners. Um, I had a good Halloween. Halloween with kids really hits different. It's super cute, but it's not as like, you know, drunk. So that's fun. We love a trick or treat moment. Um, now we have a lot of candy a lot last year I don't know how it's gonna go this year but last year my husband ate our kids Halloween candy all of it in a matter of a very short amount of time so I actually had to buy more Halloween candy to replace the Halloween candy that he ate I'm not gonna lie like I got into it too but it was him that I'm throwing him under the bus it was mostly him Um, we're trying to do better this year but it's not looking it's not looking good um yeah, my kids were really cute costumes. They were a princess, a firefighter, and a bat. I'm not going to show pics because you don't need to see my kids here, but I mean, whatever. Um, and yeah, Halloween. I think Halloween is one of the funnest, funnest uh, holidays that you can have with children because it's such a – Halloween is for kids, Halloween is not for adults. Halloween is for children, and it's the best. Um, and now it's Christmas, so that's going to be fun. I love I love Halloween, love it, and I also love Christmas. So all these people who are like, it's not Christmas season yet, it's Halloween. Like, they're both great, okay? They're both awesome. It's like you get into, you get into like September, and it's like the leaves are changing, and it's like nice. It's, it's like the temperature is great, and then it's Halloween, and it's fucking Thanksgiving, and it's great, and I love it, and it's Christmas, and it's New Year's, and then it's February, and it sucks. It's the worst. Where I live, I live in Toronto. I think I've made that known. Just like January, February, March, April are just shit. They're just shit. So cheers to that we're in we're into the we're into the good and it, we really got to soak it up because then it's just going to be shit so cheers so last week we did part one of i don't even know what we're calling this though that will be a title but it's um george franklin eileen franklin did george franklin kill susan nason um a little bit of a generous recap um so we talked about the murder of susan nason um which took place in 1969 susan was eight years old almost nine i think she was nine days away from her ninth birthday when she was she went missing and was found 10 weeks later and it's obvious that she had been murdered and left um by the side of a body of water 20 years later no, the case has long since been determined to be cold. And Eileen Franklin Lipkin comes to the police and says, I remember that it was my father, George Franklin, who murdered Susan Nason. And so they're probing her and we get to know a lot about Eileen and her family. I think it became very clear and pretty... Um, I think most people took the claim seriously that George was a very abusive father physically emotionally and sexually towards most and all of the children and his wife um it's it was made pretty clear based on what they seized from his home that he was into some like pretty aggressive sex stuff um and really seemed to be a pedophile and so that's disgusting does that make him a murderer not necessarily um so far there is zero physical evidence that george murdered susan nason but we have eileen claiming to have witnessed it janice her sister had gone to the police in 1984 which was five years before eileen did to tell them that she suspected her father as being the murderer 
again, when she went to the police, she, in her, her allegation of him being weird that day, she actually gave him an alibi for the time. So they kind of wrote her off. And also the mother, Leah, had accused him, George specifically, of having murdered Susan previously. So at this point, we are getting into not ne- not the trial yet, but just before the trial. So right before the trial, I leaned in a number of things, well, two things that the prosecution had advised her against. And one of them I had mentioned before was that um, uh, she started doing a number of interviews and media And in these interviews, she described how she recalled the memory of the murder through a series of flashbacks, which is yet another way to describe what she claims. And this story has been evolving ever since she began telling it. On the Today Show, um, she, she went on the Today Show and they had a psychiatrist who was there, you know, to be another person on the show. And this psychiatrist explained repressed memories and she talked about how they occurred and how they could later be recalled which again is up to this point and even after this point it's a very debatable it's a debated phenomenon that mental health professionals debate to this day but she had elaborated that a repressed memory could be recalled and it could be recalled in a, a number of ways. It could be a familiar smell brings on a memory or a sound. Or even, for example, she mentioned, when your child comes to the age that you were when the memory occurred and you see them and something about that jaunts your jaunts brings the memory up. I don't even know what that saying is. Um, so that was one thing she did. The second thing was um, Eileen visited her father in jail which they had advised her not to do, but she said she was going to do it anyway. So while she was there in the prison, I guess it was a jail, she asked him outright to admit to murdering Susan Mason. He obviously refused, but he also didn't deny anything. He pretty much just sat there silently and he pointed at a sign on the wall that indicated that all visits were being recorded. So essentially he was pleading the fifth, which I don't know, doesn't seem that nefarious, but... The prosecution will have a lot to say about that later. So, the highly anticipated trial began on October 31st, Halloween, in 1990. Eileen was obviously the star witness. She she was beautiful. She was well-dressed. She was articulate. She was emotional. She was everything that the prosecution could ask for in a witness. She never lost her temper. She... Well, she, you know, she got a little snippy with the defense, but who wouldn't? Um, On the other hand, George sat there the entire time at the defense table and he did not testify on his own behalf. So he was silent the whole time. He was a lot older looking. He was very weathered. He had very severe lines through like his very harsh looking face. Like he looked very menacing. And he like was he was like scoffing a lot and like kind of like laughing and like he did not appear to be taking this very seriously at all when they got to the part where Eileen began describing recalling the memory this is what she had to say at the trial quote I was sitting on the sofa in my family room and I was holding my son my daughter was playing on the floor she said something to me that caused me to look down at her At that moment, she very closely resembled Susan and I remembered Susan sitting there and seeing my father with the rock above his head, end quote. Now, I guess I have not mentioned this, but um, Eileen had a, I think I mentioned the one-year-old son, but she also had a daughter who was a couple years older. This testimony was yet another new story of how Eileen came to recall the memory. And interestingly, this came after the Today Show interview with a psychologist who mentioned that people could recall memories when their children reached the age that they were at the time of the event. That I just find very interesting. And Eileen's daughter, so at the time of the murder, Susan and Eileen were both eight years old. Um, so Eileen might have been nine, depending on when her birthday was, I don't remember. Um, but Eileen's daughter was not eight years old. She was like three or four. Needless to say, this trial, it was big. And that was like, that wasn't the biggest like crazy thing because not everybody obviously knew um, all the different stories that she had come up with before. But this trial, needless to say, was 
the first of its kind. It was the first time that somebody was being tried for murder and the only real evidence was a witness testimony of a recently recalled repressed memory. Obviously, people were fascinated. The trial was very eventful um, and a lot about Eileen's past came to light and the defense had to do everything that they could essentially to just undermine Eileen's credibility. That was the only thing that they could attack because they didn't have any physical evidence to attack. They didn't have anything else. So it did really seem, and I think it kind of didn't look great on the defense, like because this woman was clearly a victim of like sexual abuse and um, everything else. She like, you know, presented herself as a victim and all the defense did was like attack this woman and attack her, attack her, attack her, attack her, make her seem like a liar. Which... Of course they had to do, but I think a lot of people were like, oh, that's kind of mean, you know? The defense tried to include evidence that Eileen had recalled the memory during hypnosis. Now, this fact was continually denied, even by the therapist that Eileen was seeing at the time, who would have been the one to perform the hypnosis. Eileen did her best to make sense of these things here. Yes. Was George Jr. the first family member you had told? Yes. And how did it come to pass if you told him that you'd been hypnotized? When I initially told my brother that I had witnessed this murder, his response to it, he looked at me as if he thought that I were crazy. And I became very frightened at his reaction to me. And in a moment of panic, I said that I had been hypnotized in an attempt to explain my memory, which even I could not explain. And he said to me, well, that's logical because the human mind is like an onion. And when you use hypnosis, it peels away the layers. And so then he believed me completely. Now, the reason that Eileen didn't want to admit that this was all a result of hypnosis was because hypnotic-induced testimony is inadmissible. And it is admissible because it is unreliable. And this, I think, this has always been a known thing. Um, not always, but obviously, like, they started doing hypnosis to, like, recall memories and stuff, and then very quickly, and we'll, we'll discuss more about repressed memories later, so I don't want to get too deep into it, but it's very reasonable and obvious why you can't use um, memories recalled during hypnosis in a trial. So, it was a very big thing that the defense tried to make Eileen admit, and that the prosecution worked very hard to be like no this did not happen she did not she admitted that she's like I thought about doing hip not uh, hypnosis for weight loss only but not for any other reason they got Eileen to admit that she uh knew that her sister Janice went to the police to accuse their father of murdering Susan in 1984 this is not something that Eileen ever explicitly denied but it just made less sense now that the story of recalling the memory happened while she was talking to her daughter. It had always kind of been like, you know, she she kind of had this memory. It was very vague. And then it all started coming to me. And I was like kind of scared of my father. So I never wanted to say anything. But that kind of really made sense with her story. Um, and the fact that Janice had also went to the police. Like it, it made sense that like she had these feelings and thoughts and like slight memories since 1984. But now that she was saying that she didn't remember it at all and all of a sudden this memory came to light, the fact that she knew her sister had gone to the police kind of didn't jive as much with that story. You know what I mean? And so that's where the defense was really kind of attacking her. Then, one of the most compelling aspects of Eileen's testimony was that she had so many correct details of the crime and that they believed that only somebody who had witnessed the murder could have known these facts. Like that was, that was, I think the main part. And that's what the police or not the police, but the prosecution really harped on. They're like, you know, you can think all these things about her. You can make, you can even think that she's a liar, but if she knows things about the crime, or she knows things that everybody else didn't know, she had to have been there. How would she know? And if Eileen was there, then George had to have done it. 
Um, so the defense wanted to admit a bunch of old media and newspaper ar- articles that they claimed had all of these details um, that came out around the time of the murder, which would really discredit the idea that Eileen knew things that people didn't know because everything that they wanted to put in was stuff that was in the public record. But the judge wouldn't allow any of this. He, and he, his reasoning for this was that he said he didn't think that an eight-year-old would have been paying attention to the media. So what he's saying is, yes, maybe this stuff all came out, but Eileen was eight years old. She wasn't reading things. She wasn't, she didn't know what was going on. Now, the defense did try to establish that Eileen's husband had a collection of old clippings in this case, and they claimed that Barry was very involved with the whole thing and possibly for money motives. They alleged that Barry was interested in Eileen getting a movie or book deal based on the story. And it did seem in the trial that Barry, they had, like they got Eileen to admit that he did have clippings and stuff that was kept in her home office. But still, the judge would not allow any of that stuff. And this whole thing about her getting book and movie deals and stuff, that came up a lot in the trial as well. The defense asked Eileen about her being approached by writers and producers. And she stated that she was pretty much hounded by people as soon as the case came to light in the media. um, And that... This is very kind of weird, and I don't know why she would even say it like this, but initially she said that she wanted to give any proceeds to charity. But then she claimed that Barry wanted to keep some of the profits. So it's like, okay, and you you can see that right here. Have you not been approached about movie rights and or book rights attendant to this case? Right? Yes, I have been approached. Is it movie rights? Is it book rights or both? Oh, I've been approached for both. My intent, after all these producers were just barraging me with calls and wouldn't leave me alone, and I hired an attorney, was that any money that came as a result of what they call my life rights, that this money would simply go to charity. And I feel very comfortable with it, and that was my intent. And um, my husband would like to retain some of that money instead of giving it all to charity it's like she's trying to be like oh no like i don't care this i'm not in it for the money but i'm just gonna keep the money so this is kind of sketchy but I, and i do think that for a lot of a lot of people are like barry is the one who wanted that and who kind of like made her do this regardless the defense really went hard on The fact that she was trying to, um, just gonna make this a little bit. Um, they went really hard on her, possibly wanting money out of this, because it was clear that if he was uh, convicted, she stood to make a lot of money. A lot came out also about Eileen's past during the trial. So Eileen was a high school dropout and went on to become a prostitute who was arrested for prostitution and drug-related charges later in life. This was a lot and may have harmed her credibility as a witness, but actually it did prove that Eileen and her siblings, or like it helped, went on to kind of help prove or give merit to the idea that Eileen and her siblings had been sexually abused as children. The story was that Eileen got into prostitution in an effort to con- to gain control over her own sexuality, which is something she was never able to do as a child. And in a lot of the interviews that she does after the fact, she talks a lot about that. And that idea is very common. In the documentary, they actually interviewed this trauma expert and he said something very interesting, which is not, I mean, it's not anything shocking or surprising, but he was like, you know, I've done a lot of research and, and spent a lot of time with sex workers and like 99% of sex workers were sexually abused as children. It is the, it is the rule, not the exception. So I think it's, I think what happened was that the defense kind of brought all this up to be like, she was a prostitute. She's got a, a criminal history. Like we can't trust her. But then the prosecution was like, 
yeah, she was a prostitute because she was sexually abused as a child by George Franklin. And so that kind of, they kind of flipped it. Which, you know, fair enough. Um, Eileen also made claims on the stand that George had repeatedly raped and sexually abused her as a child and that her father had also once held her down while another man raped her. Now, during the trial, Eileen's story about this other man who raped her changed from the original story that she told pre-trial. Originally, in the pre-trial story, the man and that had been recorded and everyone had, had transcripts of, originally, the man that had raped her was a black man. Later, during the trial, her story changed and she said that the man was her godfather, a white man, who had raped her while her father held her down. Now, Eileen's justification for this change was that the white godfather, he was the rapist all along, but there was a Jimi Hendrix poster on the wall behind him while he was raping her. And she somehow got those mixed up in her mind. And here we see exactly whether or not this is a real memory, that kind of thing can happen because memories are very flawed. You can really, like your memories can completely be different from what actually happened, which I'm sorry, but again, we'll get into later. So the prosecution and the defense both had their own expert witnesses, psychiatrists who specialized in memories and repressed memories, all everything in that area. And obviously the the defense experts said that the repressed memories, that that repressed memories don't exist. The, the, The entire theory is just junk. And the prosecution said that they can happen. Now, the prosecution's expert had a theory that you can repress memories, but this usually happens when the traumatic event happens repeatedly. So that's a big reason that they focus so heavily on the sexual abuse that Eileen endured as a child. She was repeatedly being sexually abused and she was repeatedly watching him victimize other people that she began to repress the memories, which makes sense because we do, it it does seem like, the sexual assault allegations are true. Now, looking at the big picture of all of these sexual assault allegations, personally, I, and and I've made this very clear, I think that the allegations against George abusing his children are, they seem like very legitimate accusations. And I think there's a lot of circumstantial evidence that points that this is true. I'm inclined to believe that on at least some level, George sexually abused his children. Where this really comes into context, though, is that at the time of the trial, there was a three-year statute of limitations on sexual assault, abuse, rape of children. What there was no statute of limitations on was murder. So I think most people will understand what I'm getting at here, but for those who are not, the like kind of conspiracy theory or theory is that since Eileen was unable to accuse or charge, she can't charge as the police that charge, but she was unable to ask the police charge him for rape, sexual assault, what have you. Instead, she concocted this memory of her father killing Susan so that he could still be punished. This is clearly what the defense wanted people, the jury, to believe. And I will say one thing about the defense in this documentary. The main defense attorney, Doug Horngrad, made a huge deal. And so it's like they 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 were like, we're on his side. He's like, he didn't do this, whatever. And like, fair, they're defense attorneys. But where he, he did say in this one part that um, he was with George when George was told that one of his daughters had accused him of murder. And George's reply was, was it Janice? And he said that from that moment on, he was convinced of his innocence. Because why, if if he really had killed Susan in front of Eileen, obviously the question would be, was it Eileen? Which I, and I get this, but Eileen is the one, like Eileen was the one who would have been there, but Janice had already accused him a few years ago. And I doubt that he was unaware of this. Eileen, it seemed even up until the accusation, had the best relationship with George of all the kids, even though he raped all of them. Um, so I think the lawyer putting so much stock into being like, he said is a Janice, like he must be innocent is like, maybe, but like, 
Janice had already accused him, so it makes it makes the most sense that Janice is going to be accusing him, especially if he still has a decent relationship with Eileen. He thinks that they're all hunky dory. Um, so that's just a little aside where I'm like, eh, I don't know. You know, I'm trying to be fair to all sides here. Just hopefully I am doing my best. So we continue on with the trial. It's it's long, okay, um, and. Things get a little bit shady during the trial when it got to Janice and Leah's testimony. As we recall, Janice is Eileen's sister, the one that's older, one older than her, and Leah is her mother. So Janice, as we know, originally went to the police in 1984 and told them that she believed that her father had murdered Susan Nason, mostly because she thought he was acting weird that day, probably also because she knew he was a pedophile rapist. Um, But originally, she said that he was home at 4 15 ish which is exactly when susan should have been going missing was going missing during the trial janice backpedaled and said that she couldn't quite remember when he was home or anything about the timeline during that day leah eileen's mother also got up in the stand and again sketchy here she testified that she actually remembered around the time that susan had gone missing before she was found that george had come home at one point with a shirt covered in blood, and asked her to clean it. He told her that he had been injured while doing a painting job, and that's why he was covered in blood, and he just needed her to wash the shirt. The only problem with this testimony was that during the pretrial hearing, Leah was specifically asked by the defense if she remembered anything out of the ordinary on the day that Susan went missing. And Leah had asked, such as... And the defense attorney had said, for example, he came home with a gun or he came home with a bloody shirt or he said he murdered somebody. And her answer at the time was still no. Now, the documentary made a big deal out of this. And again, I see why. They're trying to make it look like Eileen and Janice and Leah were conspiring to get George and had done so after they had already testified or whatever. And maybe they were. Absolutely still a possibility. But the little discrepancy I see in this is that Leah was saying that she remembered he came home with a bloody shirt around the time that Susan was murdered. She specified that this was before the body was found, but did not specify that it was the day that she went missing. It took 10 weeks to find Susan. The defense line of questioning during the pretrial hearing was about the day that Susan went missing. Maybe it's semantics, in a sense, I I don't know, but I think it is worth clarifying because it is possible, like, she didn't say that he was wearing the shirt, she just came home with the bloody shirt. So, for all we know, it could have been that she goes, Susan goes missing on, I think it was September 22nd, then he comes home on September 29th, for example, with this bloody shirt. So if he's asking, did anything crazy or anything out of the ordinary happen on the day Susan went missing and she said no, that to me doesn't contradict her saying sometime before Susan was found, George came home with a bloody shirt. That's all I'm saying because a lot of stock was put into that and made her look like she was like a huge liar. Not surprisingly, Eileen also changed her original story timeline on the stand. Originally, she said that her dad picked up Susan in the morning and they went off and he killed her. During the trial, she changed it to make it the afternoon after school, which we know is when Susan was abducted. At the end of the trial, even though it seemed like there were a lot of inconsistencies, many of which I pointed out, but there were more, Eileen somehow did come off as a very credible witness. I said at the beginning, she was very articulate, she was attractive, she was emotional, she was interesting. The prosecutor told the jury that regardless of what you think about any of the evidence, if you believe that Eileen was present, if she has convinced you that she was present to watch and see the murder, then you have to convict George. He must be guilty in that case. Which, I don't know, that's kind of a flawed argument. It could have been, like, what if Eileen killed Susan? Very unlikely that an eight-year-old girl would kill another eight-year-old girl, but possible. So the jury did convict George without a drop of physical evidence. 
The jury deliberated for less than one day, and they found George guilty of first-degree murder in the uh, death of Susan Nason. Some of the jurors were interviewed after the trial um, in the documentary, and they seemed to place a lot of stock on Eileen being able to recall the specific details that they believed only someone present at the crime scene could have known. Two of the jurors that were interviewed, which there was only a few of them, maybe three to five, they pretty much, that, w- that was it to them. They're like, if, if she knew things that, that the general public didn't know, then she had to have been there. Um, And that's what they were led to believe. But they were not privy to all the old newspaper and media that had all of these details that were in the public realm. So George Franklin was sentenced to life in prison. Now, after the trial, George went away to prison and Eileen did talk show after talk show to promote her book called Sins of the Father. There was a movie made about the case called Fatal Memories, starring Shelley Long. Eileen was everywhere. And although I'm sure she had her fair share of criticism, as everybody in the public eye does, she was largely seen as some sort of hero. She was seen as being very brave, um, like a, a hero of like sexual assault survivors, yada yada. It was after the resolution of Eileen's case that a wave of, quote, recovered memory sexual assault accusations began to come to light and make their way through the criminal justice system, including notable celebrities like Latoya Jackson and Roseanne Barr. This case did more than that. It started the, like, it, first of all, it started people recalling memories and there was some that I'm sure were true and and not necessarily like that the recalled memories were true but that um people who had sexually assaulted somebody as a child like that came to light but also a lot of them were not true um and we'll talk a little bit about why very very soon um and this case did 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 more than just talk about recalled repressed memories it started a discussion regarding the statute of limitation for child molestation for civil litigation which meant that there would be um and and that came to light and and people started talking and they they actually started changing laws and slowly like it started with washington and then kind of rolled through every single state um where they took away the statute of limitations for the civil litigation so you could sue your parents for molesting you as a child and this is not the same thing as um like being able to pursue criminal charges that's civil versus criminal court now i think that nowadays it is the case that many states have either none very long or a very short statute of limitation on child molestation but in the case where they're short it starts after the person is like 21 or 23 which does make it a long statute of limitation say you get molested when you're six years old that statute of limitations is maybe the statute of limitations is three years but it doesn't start until you're 21 um and personally i see this as generally a good thing i fail to see why it is a bad thing that we have a very long statute of limitations on child molestation especially based on what we now know about child sexual abuse which is extremely prevalent that children can be groomed into thinking that the abuse is normal. Like there are a million reasons why it can take somebody a very long time to come out with the fact that they were molested at six six years old. Like you could be molested at six years old and not realize that that was a bad thing until you're 21 years old. So I do think that that is a good thing. I'm super interested in the argument of why that's not a good thing. Um, I didn't really heavily look into it, to be honest, but if anybody has, if anybody disagrees, I would absolutely love to hear your reasoning. Please come forward in the comments um, and we can chat because I, I could definitely be wrong. Um, the repressed memories, I'm not super sold on and I think most people are not, but again, we'll get there, I promise. Um, so... Now, Eileen did not just stop there. She wrote her book. She was involved with the movie. She, like, you know, 
made her rounds on every talk show imaginable she was on oprah she was on today show she was on cnn she was on larry king she was everywhere um but Eileen then also began claiming that her father was responsible for other murders and she was like talking with the police about it in all these interviews she was like oh I can't say like I can't I'm it's like being discussed right now or whatever like she would they would ask her like did he do more murders and she kept saying like I keep like I just constantly keep getting more memories like memories keep coming and I know he's responsible for other murders blah blah blah. now Eileen accused George of two other rapes and murders she started claiming that she was recalling more memories that she remembered George used to bring Eileen around with him in his van when they were and he would like go prowling about for victims and she said that like having his young daughter with him made him seem less threatening to hitchhikers who he was preying upon when the DNA eventually ruled George out of these cases it that just brought Eileen's credibility to an all-time low like it just everything came crashing down and it gave the defense team enough to appeal the original conviction they were able to get a judge to overturn george's conviction based on prosecutor prosecutorial misconduct citing a number of things including the prosecutors in their case focused on the fact that george had not denied his guilt in a number of instances which is not cool. In the criminal justice system, you have the right to remain silent. That is um, pleading the fifth. And often it is smart to do so. And you are not to be, that, that should not be held against you. Secondly, it later came out that Eileen had undergone hypnosis, not for weight loss. Both Eileen and Janice lied under oath when they said that Eileen had never gone, undergone hypnosis. And like her every her um brother and her other sister uh, I think it was Diana uh, Diana or Diana came out and were like yeah she did um and they found that her therapist had lied and said that he did not um put her under hypnosis when in fact he did thirdly all the old newspapers and news media footage those absolutely should have made it into the record it is very possible that eileen saw all of that stuff it was all part of the public domain she absolutely had the ability to have seen all of it she could have and it couldn't it, it could have been in 1988 that she found all that but still that's before she came out with the allegations it is ridiculous that a judge would not allow that as if all that stuff that had come out in what was it 69 that it just like all vanished after the fact her husband had clippings in a binder in her office her office um so that was ridiculous and it was absolutely a reason um that could have been used on appeal and was once that happened and the conviction was overturned prosecutors did opt to did not opt to retry the case and george franklin walked and he is you know he loved that unfortunately for the franklin family all uh they they all kind of just fell apart after the trial i mean it's hard to say who was at fault because they all kind of blamed each other although it does seem like most of them blamed eileen mostly like she was the one who kind of started all this so kind of does seem like her fault um and Leah and Diana both went on record stating that they no longer believed Eileen and that she had led them to lie on the stand. Diana said that she was with Eileen when they watched the news footage of the crime scene and learned about the facts of the case. And after George's release, Eileen moved to a different state and changed her name. She said that she feared her father and she now chooses to keep out of the spotlight entirely and pretty much no one's heard from her. Now, the big question remains. We are finally getting into it. Do repressed memories exist? Can we block something out entirely and then all of a sudden rem- remember it years later? The question is widely debated. One problem with trying to answer that question is that there is no way to differentiate between a true memory and a false memory. If you trick yourself into believing an alternative fact or if somebody else tricks you into believing an alternative fact it is the same to you as if it were a true fact worse still 
as we see in a lot of these cases, the human mind is extremely suggestible. After Eileen's case, we saw lots of cases of recalled memories, many of which were later found to be false memories, which were created by the therapist themselves, suggesting them into the minds of their patients, often unknowingly. This case is an example of why we should never convict a person purely on eyewitness testimony, especially a 20-year-old recalled memory. It's just not enough. I have spoken a number of times on this podcast about eyewitness testimony. Even, even a fresh one-day-old memory, you can trick yourself into believing that someone's hair was blonde when it was brown or that they were wearing a dress when they were wearing pants or what have you. The memory and, and the, mem- the human memory is so affected by emotion. It's often like emotions that keep you, that help you to remember. Like having an, a very emotional situation happen, like witnessing a murder um, or like a very eventful, something that causes you a lot of emotion, um, helps you to recall memories. Um, and so if then you're thrown into yet another emotional situation, which then causes you confusion, um, it's very easy to jumble something up and to literally convince yourself that that is what happened when it's completely the opposite thing that happened. I did read an interview with the filmmakers of Buried, and they seem to believe that Eileen, it is their opinion that Eileen believed that these memories were real, which is for sure a valid take. For most people who recall false memories, it's not that they're lying. They truly believe that these memories are true when they are false. At the end of the day, I think it's impossible to know if she truly believed these recalled memories or if she just wanted to get back at her father for abusing her. And I mean, if he truly was the monster that he claimed he was, maybe six years wasn't long enough. I don't know. I do think it's, I don't know if I believe that she believed these things or not. Um, but it's, it's even like, maybe she, I, I, I kind of, if I were to have to guess, I, I don't even like to necessarily guess because like, how do you even go about guessing? But it does seem, I, I don't know, I, it, the husband does seem sketchy. It seems like he really wanted this all to happen. It seems like there were money motives and there were motives in terms of, you know, I can't even blame if my dad did to me and I don't even want to bring my own dad to it. But if somebody's dad did to them what Eileen's father allegedly did to her, I would not blame them for wanting to send him to jail. And she, because of the statute of limitations, could not do so. So, you know, that doesn't seem like the craziest thing in the world. It's it's a bad way to go about it, especially because like Susan's parents were still there. They had to go through all of this and they want to know what happened to their daughter. And if that didn't actually happen to their daughter, then like that's like a pretty shitty thing to do to other people. Um, but it's just one of those things where it's like, okay, like, you know, you always want to, you, it's never ever a good idea. Even if somebody is not guilt, even if somebody is innocent, but they are shitty in some other ways, like Scott Peterson. Um, Sorry, what am I saying? No, even if the person is guilty, a la Jeffrey McDonald, for example. I think Jeffrey McDonald was guilty. Do I think that they convicted, they, they, they did not give him a fair trial. I don't think that they proved beyond a reasonable doubt that he did it. And, I think there's a lot of people who are like, well, we think he's guilty anyway, so that's good. But no, it's not good when the justice system works incorrectly because that same thing could happen to somebody who is innocent. The justice system needs to be held accountable for their actions and they need to... It's better that 100 guilty men go free than one innocent man go to jail. And that's 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 what the justice system is built upon, in my opinion. And... If, like in this case specifically, George Franklin seemed like a shit guy who should be in prison. But that judge should have allowed all of that media into the, um, sorry, guys, I'm losing my train of thought, but I, they, into the record. So in that sense, 
yeah, his conviction should have been overturned. It's, it's very complicated, though, because it's like he was innocent of the crime that he was being tried for, but he should be in prison. But the law did not allow him to be in prison for his sexual assault crimes because the statute of limitations, which to me is why there should not be a statute of limitations on child molestation or it should be a very long statute of limitations. Am I making sense to anybody? It's late. OK, I don't know if I'm making sense. Hopefully I am. Um, but it's a very it's a very jumbled situation. And in any case, I just think the justice system needs to follow through on their own laws, their own rules. Do you agree? Do you disagree? Am I crazy? Um, yeah, that, that's the story of, of uh, George Franklin's conviction of, of Eileen Franklin Lipkin. And the worst and saddest part of all is that Susan Nason's murder is still a cold case. And her parents are now divorced, and they have no idea what happened to their daughter. George is out, living free as a bird. Um, it is unknown whether or not he has relationships with any of his children. The entire Franklin family is s scattered, and they basically don't talk to each other, at least not Eileen. And it was just a, a complete shit show from, from start to finish. And, and also was followed by a number of false recalled memories and and that goes in it right into like the satanic panic and everything and i don't know if who knows about that but that's another thing that i'd really like to cover because that was a very crazy time um i would say that a lot of innocent people were made to look like monsters in a way as a result of this case so it was big and I do think that the documentary series Buried did a, did a very good job. It was a very interesting and compelling documentary. And I would suggest it after you watch two parts of my podcast. Um, so I think that's going to do it. And I hope you enjoyed. I hope I told this story in a way that made sense. It was not super chronological. I like to do things chronologically because I think that just to me makes the most sense. Um, but... This was a little back and forth, so please let me know if you think there are any any ways I could improve upon my storytelling, um, as that's what I'm doing. I'm just telling stories. And thank you so much for listening to my stories. Like it's pretty cool that uh, an amount of people are listening. Um, please reach out on Instagram at Who's Knocking Podcast, Twitter at Who's Knocking Pod. I got a TikTok, TikTok. I got a TikTok going really trying hard as a millennial I don't don't mesh too well with the TikTok it's very short um short uh videos I love I love a long form but you know going for it and sign up for my newsletter um you can do that at groomweekly.com it is a true crime newsletter it is fun it is fab people love it some do I won't tell you how many but an amount um and it's free so please do all of those things if you so choose and i would really really appreciate it if you would like and subscribe my videos that really helps and means a lot i don't make any money on these maybe one day i will who knows um but like liking sharing subscribing that really really helps and takes like two seconds so if you could do that that would be great and please stay safe out there because you never know <laughs> please stay safe out there because you never know who's knocking This podcast is produced in collaboration with Lost Line Media. Artwork by August Digital. Music by Matthew Cook.